Based on Jonathan Stroud's book, Lockwood & Co., is developed and directed by Joe Cornish, along with William McGregor and Catherine Morshed for Netflix. Garnering a 92% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, this British supernatural detective thriller series is received well, both by critics and audiences, because it stays true and respectful to its source material. Now, without further ado, let us dive into the thrilling and mysterious world of Lockwood & Co. Many years ago, a phenomenon called the problem caused ghosts to become more active and deadlier. A touch of a ghost will surely mean death, while others who come face to face with them experience what is called ghost lock, which is a comatose-like state. Weirdly, adults cannot sense ghosts, but children can. The younger generation acquired a gift to sense the ghosts through their vision, feeling, or hearing. In this sense, the teenagers were trained to be ghost hunters. One afternoon, two ghost hunters named Lucy Carlyle and Anthony Lockwood go on their first mission together. Arriving at the haunted house, their client, Mrs. Hoax, shows up and explains that ever since her husband died, disturbances have been very frequent and strong. In this sense, she wants to sell it, but nobody will dare to buy a haunted house so it needs fixing and cleansing first. In a flashback, a 13-year-old Lucy was brought by her mother into a local agency owned by Mr. Jacobs to be a ghost hunter. Lucy didn't want to deal with ghosts, yet her mother forced her to make money for her. In the agency, Lucy met another girl named Nori, who later on became her best friend. A few years passed and they got their third grade certificate as a ghost hunter. Unfortunately, everything went wrong in their next mission, leaving only Lucy as the survivor while Nori got into ghost locked and all their other friends dead. To make matters worse, all of the blame was put on Lucy after Mr. Jacobs set her up in court. Her mother also didn't side with her and wanted Lucy to beg Mr. Jacobs to give her a job again. This served as the last straw for Lucy, so she confronted her mother, stating that all she cared about was money. With that, Lucy ran away from home and went to London. There, she tried to apply to different agencies, starting with the infamous Fitz and Rotwell, but failed to get into any of them. Luckily, she saw an advertisement about an agency called Lockwood & Co. But to her surprise, it was run by two boys of her age, Anthony Lockwood and George Karim. Eventually, she passed all their exams with flying colors, so she became the listener of the group, even though Lockwood knows that she faked her fourth grade credentials. Going back to the present, Lucy closes her eyes and listens to the surroundings for any signs of Mrs. Hope's husband. Meanwhile, Lockwood already sees the old man's death glow on the bottom of the stairs. The two move upstairs, but instead of finding Mr. Hope's ghost, they encounter an enraged ghost of a woman that attacks them, nearly causing Lucy to fall. Luckily, she grabs onto the picture frame on the wall while Lockwood fights the ghost using his rapier. When the ghost vanishes, Lockwood helps Lucy and they quickly find the corpse of the ghost which turns out to be stuck on the wall. The enraged ghost then comes back to attack once again. This time, it nearly touches Lockwood so Lucy throws magnesium flares at it. Although it makes the ghost vanish for a while, it unfortunately causes fire to the house. When the ghost comes back, Lucy quickly covers up her corpse with a silver net, believing that it's her source. Before leaving, Lucy takes the ring from the woman's corpse and they jump to save themselves from the burning house. As she wakes up from the fall, she starts looking for Lockwood, but the officers from the Department of Physical Research and Control, also known as DPRAC, find her first. They take her to the hospital that Lucy sneaks out shortly, eventually seeing ghost lock patients on her way to finding the door. Meanwhile, an officer from DEPRAC named Inspector Montague Barnes talks to Lockwood, stating that his agency owes £60,000 to Mrs. Hope. Worse, they need to pay within two weeks or Lockwood & Co. will be shut down. Some time later, Lucy gets home alone so George asks where Lockwood is. In turn, Lucy annoyingly tells him what happened, to which he responds that none of it will happen if they just waited for him. George is the researcher of the group and upon hearing what happened, he immediately knows that it wasn't an old man's ghost that attacked Lockwood and Lucy. At this time, Lucy sees George's research on the table, one of which is a newspaper that has a picture of a woman whose ghost attacked them. According to George, the woman is Annabel Ward, a rising star in the 80s until she just vanished. Hearing this, Lucy states that upon listening to her ghost, she felt like Annabel needed her help. Just then, Lockwood arrives but he wants to rest first before discussing the problems at hand. Because of that, Lucy decides to rest as well. But as she falls asleep, Annabelle's ring falls to the floor and her spirit manifests in her room, meaning that the ring is her source all along. Upon waking up, Lucy finds the ghost floating over her so she gets away and calls for Lockwood and George. Facing Annabelle's ghost again, they manage to defeat the ghost and contain the ring. After that, Lucy apologizes, stating that she doesn't know that the ring is Annabelle's source. She also explains that she has some sort of a connection to her, which Lockwood suggests might be a psychic connection. With that, 
they try to test that theory by letting her connect with the ghost again. At first, everything seems going well, but upon coming to the point where she died, it's like Annabelle possesses her body as Lucy felt how she suffered back then. Also, she discovers that Annabelle was strangled to death, so she tries to convince Lockwood and George that they should give justice to Annabelle. However, Lockwood points out that they need to be working right now, revealing to them the 60,000 pounds they owe to Mrs. Hope. Their conversation is then interrupted by a phone call from Barnes, stating that Lockwood should fire Lucy right now. As it turns out, Barnes discovers that Lucy didn't finish her fourth grade, which makes her employment illegal. But when Lucy asks what the call is about, Lockwood lies and says it's just a wrong number. Instead, Lockwood decides to take Annabelle's case, thinking that they will be famous if they solve it. Hence, they will get more clients and they will eventually have the means to pay their fines. Hearing this, Lucy doesn't want publicity so she tells Lockwood to keep her out of the spotlight. After that, they go to the British Archives to research more about Annabelle. There, they discover that she starred in Hamlet and was rumored to be in a relationship with her co-star Hugo Blake. Because of this, they think that it's a case of abuse that led to murder. At this time, a group of Fitz agents led by Quill Kipps shows up, making fun of Lockwood and his group. But he doesn't let it pass and swings Kipps' rapier into the ceiling then leaves. Outside, Lockwood tells Lucy and George to grab dinner first because he has other things to do. As it turns out, he went to a TV station, announcing that they're close to solving the mystery case of Annabelle Ward. However, Lockwood openly says Lucy's name in the interview, naming her as his greatest asset which pisses her off. Some time later, a DEPRAC officer shows up at their doors and takes Lucy and Lockwood to the headquarters to test if Lucy really can identify Annabelle's killer like Lockwood said on TV by showing her Hugo. Upon seeing him, Lucy suddenly feels scared and suffocates, insisting to Barnes that she cannot give them anything of use to put Hugo behind bars. Meanwhile, at home, George gets attacked by a masked intruder. Shortly after, Lucy and Lockwood arrive and find that the door is bolted from the inside. Due to this, they know that something is wrong and carefully enter through the window. Then, Lockwood deals with the intruder while Lucy frees George. Luckily, Lockwood manages to get the upper hand, forcing the intruder to escape. After that, George takes them to the basement and shows them the empty container of the ring. According to him, Hugo must have sent the intruder to steal the ring because it could be used against him as evidence. The two boys think that they have already lost. But to their surprise, it's revealed that Lucy already stole it earlier that day and kept it with her inside the locket necklace she's wearing. Later on, they examine the ring and see hallmarks that lead to a page and passage in the book Hamilton. They think that it's a sign that Hugo and Annabelle were indeed in a relationship. Yet, Lockwood says it still cannot prove that Hugo murdered her so they need more evidence than that. Also, they have another pressing issue at hand because the deadline for their fine is nearing. In that sense, they take a job from John Fairfax of Fairfax Iron, one of the most influential men in the country. Fairfax wants his comm carry hall clean before selling it but he needs the mission to be discreet. In turn, Lockwood makes a deal with him that they will finish the job for him if he pays their agency's fine, considering the potential danger of the mission. After getting the deal, the three prepare for their mission. According to George's research, the comm carry hall used to be a satanic priory of a medieval cult. However, they still need the money so they have no choice but to go. The next day, the group is taken by Fairfax's secretary to the hall where the man is waiting for them. However, it's later on revealed that this mission is a setup for the three of them to die because it was actually Fairfax who killed Annabelle. After barely saving themselves from the ghosts of the monks, Lockwood realizes that it was Fairfax who was with Annabelle in the photo they have. And if they look further into the hallmarks in the ring, it would lead them to Fairfax. On their way out, they see Fairfax and his secretary waiting for the three in the living room, planning to kill them at all costs. At this time, he also admits that he killed Annabelle and it was his secretary that broke into their house last time in an attempt to steal the ring. In this sense, Fairfax asks Lockwood for the ring, but he insists that they don't carry it around. But to his surprise, Lucy suddenly declares that she has it, stating that Annabelle has been wanting to see Fairfax for a very long time. With that, she throws the ring into the air and Annabelle's ghost manifests, ultimately killing Fairfax. Finally getting justice, Annabelle's ghost looks at Lucy, silently thanking her. Witnessing this, his secretary starts to run away, but she's stopped by DDPRAC. They happen to know where the three were after following the research that they found in their house when they came looking for them. And because they operated without letting the department know, Lockwood, Lucy, and George get arrested. But to their surprise, Barnes approaches them, saying that they need to sign a non-disclosure agreement if they don't want to be in jail. 
Even the inspector doesn't know what's going on, but he encourages them to do so for their own good because it's the order of the deputy commissioner. Yet, because of what they accomplish, even though the public won't know it, DEP RAC awarded Lucy a fourth grade certificate. Afterward, as Lucy is about to put her certificate on the records, she suddenly hears a voice calling to her, causing her to faint. Upon waking up, she sees the two coming home from a mission. As it turns out, she's been asleep for 14 hours. Shortly after, they receive two guests, Pamela Joplin and Sebastian Saunders of Sweet Dreams Excavations, to hire the team for a job. They want them to check the hidden and unmarked grave that might contain a dangerous ghost, which they gladly accept. Later that night, the three go to the cemetery to get the work done. After preparing everything they need, they open up the iron casket which happened to be buried even before the problem took place. Opening it, George sees the remains of the person with a bullet wound in the end, holding what seems to be a mirror. Meanwhile, Lucy is overwhelmed by the sensation around the corpse, hearing flies buzzing all over her ears and wounding herself. At the same time, George gets a glimpse of a mirror, distracting him for a while. Because of this, they finish the work quickly by covering the corpse with a silver net. After that, the rest of Saunders' crew arrive. However, while inspecting the corpse, George and Joplin accidentally pull out the silver net, causing the ghost of the man to manifest. Acting quickly, Lucy throws her sword to the ghost while George puts the net back. Going back home, Lucy goes to the basement and talks to the jar of ghost, realizing that it was the one who called her when she passed out before. And she's proven to be right when the ghost talks back to her. Lucy is just like the infamous Marissa Fitz, the only person in history who managed to talk a ghost into an actual conversation. The ghost then tells her that they're in danger, referring to the room in the house where no one is allowed to enter but Lockwood. Overwhelmed, she's about to close the jar, yet the ghost repeatedly says that death is coming. Just then, Lockwood and George arrive, arguing about George letting Joplin meddle in their job. At this time, Lucy tells them about the ghost in the jar, stating that it knows about Lockwood's secret door to prove that it's real. Yet, this triggers Lockwood that if she speaks about that room again, she will be fired. Later on, Lockwood goes to her room to attend to her wound and apologizes for his behavior earlier. According to him, whatever is behind that door is connected to his tragic past and he's not the type of person who wants to talk about it. But he tells her that he believes that she can talk to ghosts and that she's as powerful as Marissa Fitz. After that, they go to George so Lockwood can apologize to him as well, only to find him missing. Seeing what he's been up to, Lockwood and Lucy go back to the cemetery where they find him, Barnes, and Kip's group. As it turns out, a relic man stole the mirror from the dead body from the iron casket, so Barnes puts Kipps in his group in the case. Bobby, the researcher in Kipps' group, explains that the corpse was a victim of violent labor conflict and was put in a still to bury him illegally in the cemetery. On the contrary, George declares that the victim is none other than Dr. Edmund Bickerstaff, the same man who became famous after being labeled as a necrophiliac. George says that all the pervert stories about him were a cover for a creepier and grimmer reason why he was digging up corpses, pointing out that he might be a member of a ghost cult. He also adds that because of this, the mirror will be worth a fortune when it reaches the black market. The two groups then start arguing about who should handle the case. So Barnes settles it and puts all of them together to find the missing mirror. As expected, Lockwood and Kipps aren't fond of working together. In this sense, they make a bet instead. Whoever finds the mirror first wins, with the loser quitting ghost hunting for good. And with that, the race for the mirror begins. Going back to the cemetery, the three see that Kipps' group gets the head start. Talking to Joplin and Saunders, the man tells them that Kipps is thinking that what happened was an inside job. Yet, Lockwood and George think otherwise. Examining the crime scene, George finds a Tendi's badge that happens to belong to someone Lockwood knew, an agent who became a relic man. A little later, they find the person that owned the badge, only that he's dead already. Reporting it to DEPRHC, Lockwood lies to Barnes, saying that he doesn't know the man so they can have a head start over the other group. Everyone is thinking that this is a case of double crossing so Barnes orders the two groups to get to work immediately. With that, the three go on their separate tasks, with George going to the archives while Lockwood and Lucy meet an old friend of the former. But to Lucy's surprise, Lockwood's old friend is a relic woman called Flo Bones. As it turns out, Flo was also friends with the relic man they found dead. Going to a diner, Lockwood asks about the dead man's partner, thinking that he has the mirror or at least the answer to where it is. According to Flo, the man they're looking for is Jack Carver, a relic man who's always dealing with Julius Wingman, a black market dealer posing to be an antique shop owner. However, Flo warns them that if Jack won't kill them, Wingman will surely do. Yet, 
Lockwood still leaves a message for Jack on the board with their address on it and forces Lucy to go to Winkman's shop. Meanwhile, at the archives, George managed to get in with the help of Joplin. Together, they conduct research about Bickerstaff and the mirror. Going back to Lucy and Lockwood, they manage to sneak into the shop quietly but Lockwood is still caught by Winkman's son. Luckily, Lucy is able to hide before the mother shows up and tases Lockwood. After that, they take him to Winkman and he starts questioning Lockwood while torturing him. At the same time, Lucy continues looking for the mirror, eventually finding it. However, the son finds her as well, and so is the mother. Taking her where Lockwood is, he begs Winkman not to hurt Lucy, even offering his own life for hers. Lucy, on the other hand, waits for the right moment to stand up and spills fuel on Winkman and his wife, threatening to burn them alive if they don't let them go. Outside, they remember that George must be home by this time and Jack might be coming. Due to that, they get a cab to get home quickly, luckily finding George unharmed. Just then, they hear someone knocking and upon checking, Lockwood sees that it's Jack. However, as they open the door, they discover that Jack is attacked with a dagger on his back. In his last moments, Jack utters the name Bone Glass, referring to the actual name of the mirror. Shortly after, DEPRAC arrives to investigate and cleans up the mess. George explains to Barnes that the weapon used to kill Jack is a muggle dagger from India. He says that it always comes in pairs so if they find the other one, they will know who murdered Jack. The next day, the three discuss what George found out about Bickerstaff and the Bone Glass. According to his research, Bickerstaff was a lunatic doctor who was exposed by a woman named Mary Delac who suddenly went missing after attending one of the doctor's meetings. Yet, ten years later, she resurfaced but she's already gone mad. In this sense, they are starting to put the pieces together on how dangerous the bone glass is. And to Lucy's surprise, the ghost in the jar speaks again, stating that they're finally catching up. Asking what he knows, the ghost says all the answers they're looking for are in the house of his master, the infamous Edmund Bickerstaff himself. With that, the three take the jar to Bickerstaff's abandoned house and he guides Lucy to where she can find the answers. However, the ghost only wants her to go so Lockwood and George are forced to stay at the receiving area. Arriving at what used to be a dining-slash-operating room, Lucy sees a trapdoor and realizes that there's a switch under the operating table. It's then revealed that inside the trapdoor was Bickerstaff's office. At this time, the ghosts of Bickerstaff's victims start appearing one by one so Lucy quickly gets the file she needs from the doctor's table. However, she gets trapped inside on her way out. Luckily, the two boys decided to follow her and found the trap door, opening it to rescue her. Going back home, Lucy puts the jar away when Lockwood notices footprints on the floor. Following it, he discovers Flo waiting for him at the library. According to her, Winkman is holding a private auction at midnight where he will surely sell the bone glass. When Flo leaves, George talks to Lockwood and Lucy, telling them about what he finds out about Bickerstaff's files. He explains that even before the problem happened, the doctor was already experimenting with theories about the dead, hence the murdered patients he got on the secret door. By cutting body pieces off of his patients while they were still alive, their souls got more attached to their bodies, ultimately making it their source after they died. In short, Bickerstaff might have had something to do with the problem, hence the importance of bone glass just got exponentially higher. Also, Mary turned out to have written a book that might contain the explanation they were looking for. However, the only copy of the book can only be found in the Black Library in Fitz. And, as luck would have it for them, they just got invited to the ball that will be held on Fitz later that night. Due to that, Lucy and Lockwood decide to go to the ball while George stays at home to study more about the bone glass with the help of Joplin. Before leaving, Lockwood reminds George that they need to meet with Flo at midnight for her to take them to the auction. Upon arriving at the ball, Lucy and Lockwood go separate for a while so they do not look suspicious. Alone, Lucy is surprised when Penelope Fitz approaches her. According to her, Lucy is a good agent and tries to hire her in her agency, despite knowing what truly happened back in her hometown. But what surprises her more is when Penelope states that she ordered the closure of Jacob's agency because of what happened. Although thankful and honored, Lucy respectfully declines her offer, saying that she already found the right agency for her, and the lady gladly accepts her decision. Just then, Lockwood shows up and says they need to find the book now. With that, they make their way to the library and look for the book. But just as when they're about to leave, Penelope enters the room with a mystery man, talking about some guests who are not happy with how she handles things. This conversation brings a different Penelope from how she acted around Lucy earlier, signifying that she's hiding something. When Penelope leaves, the man notices Lockwood and Lucy who are hiding. Left with no other choice, Lockwood fights the man who pulls out his golden rapier. As expected, the man is winning so Lucy has to intervene, allowing her and Lockwood to escape the party. 
Afterward, they meet with George and Flo and ride her boat to get to the auction. Then, Lucy and Lockwood head inside the building while George and Flo stay behind as the extraction do. There, they pose as buyers and wait for the right time to steal the bone glass. Unfortunately, their cover has been busted so Lucy lights a bomb to distract Winkman and his men, allowing Lockwood to get the mirror and other sources, weaponizing it against the men that are coming after them. However, the man from the ball turns out to be at the auction for the bone glass as well, so Lockwood and Lucy fight him together until she knocks him out. After that, they head to the rooftop while George and Flo are waiting at the river. To their surprise, the man gets back up and tackles Lockwood, forcing Lucy to throw the mirror at the two below. Lockwood then gets out of the man's restraint and tells Lucy to jump into the water. Meanwhile, George and Flo go straight to DEPRAC to surrender the bone glass. Before going in, Flo suggests that she and George could just throw the mirror into the bottom of the sea where no one will ever get it again. Yet, George wants to do the right thing and give it to the authorities. But in the sudden turn of events when Flo is gone, George takes the mirror for himself and goes to Joplin. As it turns out, upon inspecting the mirror for the first time back then, they happen to look into it, making them crave more of what they saw. Going back to Lockwood and Lucy, they review Mary's book at home, which turns out to be a confession that she was the one who killed Bickerstaff. According to the book, Bickerstaff forces her to look into the bone glass, so she protected herself and shot the doctor. But it was too late as she already got a glimpse of the mirror, stating that it wasn't an ordinary piece of glass but is truly a window. Looking closely at the illustration, they see a whirlpool-like drawing in the glass like it's signifying that it's sucking everyone who's looking at it. And as they put aside everything on the table, they see that George has been drawing whirlpool lines all along, remembering that he got to look at the bone glass back at the cemetery. Because of that, they realize that it's not yet over as their friend got his hands on the mirror once again. Concurrently, George meets with Joplin at the cemetery as they plan to test what is truly inside the bone glass. Going deeper into the cemetery, George notices that someone is following them so he checks it and sees Kip struggling to fight a ghost. Helping him, George realizes that Kip is already losing his ability to sense ghosts. In turn, he warns him not to tell everyone or he will kill George. But to her surprise, a dagger is pointed behind him as Joplin shows up to cuff and put a bag on Kip's head. Seeing this, George wonders why Joplin is carrying such things. Just then, he realizes that Joplin wants to test the mirror by having someone with sensing abilities look at it. Hence, if Kips didn't show up, the dagger, cuff, and bag are all for him. At this time, he also recognizes her dagger as the muggle dagger, meaning that she was the one who killed Jack. In short, Joplin gets mad as well, just like Bickerstaff. To make matters worse, Bickerstaff's corpse is with them because Joplin wants him to see what she's doing. Hearing all this, Kips gets so scared that he admits that he lost his sensing ability already. Because of that, Joplin has no other choice but to revert to her original plan and threatens George to sit in front of the mirror. Meanwhile, Lockwood and Lucy arrive at the cemetery, carrying the ghost in the jar. But to their surprise, Kip's group shows up, looking for their leader, stating that Kips followed George inside the mausoleum and now he's missing. Knowing this, Lockwood convinces them that they're also here for George so they all end up working together. Unfortunately, the conflict with Winkman is not yet done as he and his men show up at the cemetery as well. Due to that, they all decide to face them while Lucy will look for George and Kips to save them. Yet, as expected, the agents are still struggling to fight the goons because they're older and stronger. But since they're in the cemetery, they use it to their advantage, using ghosts to deal with their enemies. Afterward, Lockwood follows Lucy inside the mausoleum, only to find the same man from the ball and auction again. At this time, Lockwood tries to get into the man's good side, stating that he's working with Fitz now. But to his shock, the man declares that he's not working for Fitz. He then mocks Lockwood, saying that his life is insignificant, just like his parents. At that moment, Lockwood realizes that this man had something to do with his parents' death. But before he could even react, the man shot him. At the same time, Lucy finds George tied in the chair. To make matters worse, Bickerstaff's ghost is already manifesting. Distracted, Lucy doesn't notice that Joplin catches her already. George tells her that she shouldn't be here, yet Lucy tells Joplin that she will be the one to look into the mirror, revealing that she can talk to ghosts like the legendary Marissa Fitz. Hearing all this, Joplin agrees to her requests, only to be tricked because when Lucy steps in front of the mirror, she pulls out the ghost in the jar and lets it look at the mirror instead. Looking at it, the ghost wails as if he's seeing something horrifying, stating that certain people were trapped. Meanwhile, Lucy gets a glimpse of deaths like the ghost in the jar, Fairfax, even the ghost lock Lucy, and presumably Lockwood's future death. Because of that, she gets ghost locks of George tackles the mirror, 
breaking in the process. Luckily, Lucy snaps out of it and they witness how Joplin gets killed while holding the broken bone glass. After that, all the souls that Bickerstaff trapped in the relic get freed at last. However, they're not yet safe as Bickerstaff's ghost threatens to kill them while slowly ghost-locking them so they cannot escape. Just then, Lockwood, who turns out to be alive, shows up and saves the two, allowing Lucy to cover the corpse with a silver net, finally putting an end to this fight. Some time later, D.E.R.A.C. arrives and assists them while clearing the crime scene. Kipps then approaches Lockwood, letting him know that he will honor their deal, but Lockwood says he can forget it and call them even. Barnes also commends them all for solving the case. Unknown to all of them, the unnamed man meets with Penelope again, conspiring in their next move. Some time later at home, Lucy records a message for Nori, telling her about all of the adventures that she went through. The movie ends with Lockwood stating that there shouldn't be more secrets between the three of them, so he takes Lucy and George into the secret room in the house. Lockwood & Co. is a great series that captures the balance between mystery, thriller, action, and even romance. The audiences will not have a hard time connecting to the characters as they are well-grounded and well-written. Overall, this is a great start, especially since the show is hinting for the next seasons to come.